But That's all right. right, this is the Forum Book Club. We're taking the last uh, session on Silver Mari's book from Fire by Water. And we think we may even have uh, Sorab visible here, along with Vivian Dudrow, myself, Father Fascio at Ignatius Press, uh, Joseph Pierce in South Carolina. We're a little bit late uh, because of technical inadequacies on the part of one of your hosts. <laughs> it's not Vivian, it's, and it's not Joseph, and it's not our guest, Sorab. So, now we're here. Joseph, you're already in charge of the content here. What do you want to do? Um, well, I mean, obviously, in the previous weeks, we've been looking at passages from the book and discussing them. But I think, obviously, we have the great privilege and pleasure of having the author here with us. And I thought we may as well you know, put the ball in his court somewhat and, um, you know, maybe ask him questions and let him wax lyrical. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Why don't you ask him a question or two? Okay. Well, the first thing that really struck me, um, so Rob, is that, uh, I, first of all, my ignorance of Iran, which I sort of knew I was ignorant of Iran, but it made it very patently obvious reading your book. But uh, what I found very interesting was even in, in societies that we imagine to be totalitarian and tyrannical, and of course, Iran is both of those things, but we, we, or at least I, um, have this vision of sort of uh, George Orwell's 1984, where there's absolutely no freedom at all. And you kind of, whereas in your book, you know, that you were watching American TV, that you were freely able, it will be technically illegally, to, uh, to get hold of, uh, of uh, videos of, uh, of American films. Um, and you were even able to, sort of, if you like, to flaunt your pro-American stance at school and and not be butchered. Um, so I, I, this sort of intrigued me because it's, it, it, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research into Elizabethan England in research of Shakespeare. And is there a, is there a question in here somewhere? Yes, there is. But it's a discussion as well. And I'm just contextualizing the question. So what, what I really want Sorab to be to be able to maybe de, to explain is the extent to which, uh, should we say, even tyranny is relative. <laughs> Uh, in terms of comparing it, for instance, with George Orwell's 1984? I think that's, a, that's an astute observation, Joseph. Um, the, uh, all systems of government are run by human beings. And what that means is that they are marked by um, uh, you know, our fallenness, our, uh, our capacity for, for evil, but also our capacity for uh, mercy and and uh, gentleness and so forth so yes the iranian regime as readers read in the book technically if you're caught with alcohol you can be uh, uh flogged and that's the law on the books but in your day-to-day -day interaction with the com the morality committee um other things can prevail you can i you know you might be able to get away by bribery by appealing to the to the other to the totalitarian agents um, baser side you know he's not a pure ideologue he's also a family man he wants to uh, 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 take care of his own family and and twenty dollars in his pocket uh, will do that or you can appeal to his conscience you know sir you know don't, don't human oh, element which means there's always an element of there's a mysterious dimension to it, uh, but also an element of freedom in every system. Yeah, and I, I think I do think that's useful for, for people to, to understand. I think we get this vision that you know, in a totalitarian regime, everyone's hiding in the corner in the house and scared to say anything or go outside. Or, and it, I think that that sense of realism that you conveyed was, was certainly very helpful to me and, and taught me a lot about Iran in particular, but but also tyranny and totalitarianism in general. So so thank you for that. So there was also uh, in your experience, Saurabh, there were two liturgical events that were pretty critical. One was one around Penn Station, the third feast when you went into the Capuchin Church. Other was when you went into Brompton Oratory. Uh, 
Uh, but Vivian, at lunch, you had made a point about the first experience, which I want to ask him about. So make your point. Oh, well, it's a question. Um, so when you went to the uh, chapel near the station, uh, that mass was in English, right? That was a low mass in English. Yes. Okay. And so the part that moved you at the consecration, uh, when you heard those words, this is my body, um, that's when you made the association that a sacrifice was occurring and that all of this uh, buildup in your soul to desire sacrifice, that's that aha moment, right, when you heard those words. And then later, when you were at the Brompton Oratory, that Mass was in Latin, right? Mm -hmm. In which I'm not fluent. Okay, and yeah, so, really, so, my, so, my, so, you know, there are a lot of, as you know, a lot of liturgy debates going on in the church. And, um, you know, I was just wondering if, the, if your first experience of the Mass had been the one at the Brompton Oratory, would you have been struck, and I realize this is a theoretical question, but do you think it would have struck you in the same way? Do you think you would have understood that a sacrifice was being made uh, if if you hadn't been able to understand the words of the consecration, I think it would have uh, struck me more, but I would have understood less. It would have struck me more because that mass, um, I think, is a richer presentation of both the symbolism and the supernatural action of the mass, um, and it w it would have been an experience I would not soon have forgotten but i would have i don't think i would have put two and two together to understand that um this is an altar like every altar of every civilization that has ever offered sacrifice which all civilizations have and but in this case it's god himself offering himself up as as the lamb as a sacrificial lamb i don't think i would have understood that as much in a in it but it would have been, it would have at the level of of mystery and emotion and imagination i've no doubt that the brompton mass would have made more of an impression on me but overall my state of mind it that in going to that mass was one of um i am lousy i am abject i need something to to, to redeem me and as it happened i found the mass but thereafter within 12 hours i had forgotten about it um in the sense that I, we bargained with God, and I sort of said, "Please redeem me from this moment," and then, and then I'll, I'll promptly, for, you know, forget about you for a while. So, in either case, it would probably have taken me some time to get to the point of actually uh, uh, willingly seeking out the Roman Catholic Church. So, Rob, uh, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. Mark Brumley and I were in New York, and we visited. Uh, but I said mass that morning at at. Uh, Father Rutler's parish, St. Michael's, mm -hmm. uh, and I you know, had on my mind, you know, what you would say in your book, but as we drove through New York uh, on, in the cab, and there was all kinds of construction going on, and parking back and forth, and people making noise, and it was just, just loud, 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 and then we opened the door, walking into St. Michael's Church, shut the door, all the noise disappeared, it was dark, the sanctuary light was on, there's gold leaf around things, beautiful baldacchino, and it was it was like stepping into another world. So I think even uh, even had the mass not been going on, there might have been some experience there of the you know going from the the, the world which is chaotic and you know and we we, we just want to need we need help and walking into this peaceful serenity of a, of a sacred space. But I'm wondering. Uh, what what's now that, that was some time ago now what's your preference oh, i don't like preferences liturgically now that's a very good question i um i, I have a family now so i have a, a son whom i like to take to mass um but he uh, and i so i'm registered at a church in new york uh, that has the latin mass i'm a parishioner so it has a high, high solemn Latin mass on Sundays, but my son can't sit through all of it. So then uh, I vary because sometimes I need that, that beauty of the Latin mass, that sung creed, you know, uh, there's nothing more stirring 
than that unam sanctam catholicam and i just it gives me goosebumps every time so i need it sometimes which means that i will go alone on some sundays to have that and then on other sundays when i want to take him and my wife then we'll go to um a different church that's more first of all the liturgy doesn't is not it's not an hour and 20 minutes an hour and 30 minutes it's, it's more like 50 minutes and uh it's a reverent novus ordo mass and then during the weekday i i, I try to go to mass daily not, not, i don't always succeed but on those days i i'm just closest to saint patrick's cathedral and my day is so packed that i'm very grateful for the 20 minute uh daily english masses at, at saint pat's well so it's a mix of all I'm an unusual creature, you know, hybrids are big these days, like Toyota Priuses and so on. But I, I celebrate ordinarily the Novus Ordo Mass, but in Latin. Uh, I, I use mm -hmm. English for the readings and the prayers and the, and the preface. That is everything which changes each day. Mm -hmm. I celebrate the rest which stays the same, especially Canon 1, the Roman Canon in Latin. So. Should you come out here, Sorab, I'll celebrate Mass for you, and it won't be take more. It won't take an hour and a half, unless my homily gets too wandering, which does happen as I get older. But uh, I, I like it, you know. <laughs> Even no, I, and I have to mention, by the way, that the, the Mass that is described in the book in the final chapter at the Brompton Oratory is not the traditional Latin Mass. It's also it's a Novus Ordo Mass uh. in Latin. Okay, um, and, and so <clears throat> with also with the with with the, with the variable parts being done in English. So the, the, I'm I'm quite fond of that format actually that you just described. Well, so you're young and energetic and a talented writer. So I hope to pass the torch on to you uh, from Brompton Oratory and me to you that uh, in the future you can agitate for a more widespread use. Of, of the, the hybrid. Of the Novus Ordo Latin, exactly right. I call it the Mass of Vatican II, because mm -hmm. that is what the Vatican II fathers were thinking about when they talked about the reform of liturgy. Mm -hmm. Joseph, you might have a comment on this. <laughs> I was keeping a tactful silence, but as, you, as, you, as you've uh, asked, uh, I've actually, I, I, I love the Mass, the, the Novus Ordo Latin Mass that you do, because I experienced it for many years, of course, when we were both blessed to have each other's neighbors at Ave Maria University. So I love the way you celebrate Mass, and I have absolutely no problem and no difficulty with it whatsoever. But we're very blessed locally now to have a diocesan parish that offers the Mass in both forms, and our preference is to go to the noon traditional Latin Mass. And as I've got to, uh, to know that better through experience, I've got to love it more, and so I'm very, very much at home, as, it, as is my whole family, with the traditional Mass now. Thanks. Thanks to Pope Benedict XVI and the Moto Proprio, which made it available in the Dostum and parishes. That was another thing, sir, of the read. Of course, I, I love Pope Benedict. Closer, I mean, he was my mentor, my doctor, doctor, doctor father, as they say, on my thesis. And I knew him well before the rest of the world got to know him. Uh, but, you know, you, you experienced him kind of coming afresh, and you experienced the Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, that we know. I mean, profound powerful writer, clearly deeply spiritual, uh, and just so embraces the fullness of the Catholic tradition. So it was a joy for me to see that he and his writing uh, were so important for you in your, in your conversion. I mean, um, I, I can't say, I can't compliment him more than, than I did in, in the book, in, the, in, in my memoir, uh, where I truly think I, I, uh, I became Catholic uh, because of because of Jesus Jesus of Nazareth, and it's all those qualities that you mentioned. Um, this kind of humane wisdom and a and a worldly wisdom, uh, a deep erudition, which if you fancy yourself an intellectual and you think that you might be uh, uh, too intelligent for things of God, because they're for simple people, it instantly humbles you, but it humbles you in a gentle way. And that erudition is never academic. In other words, it's the perfect mix of being uh, supremely detailed and precise, but also written in normal language. Which, by the way, I don't I don't read German, but but in translation, it certainly reads like beautiful prose. So 
all of those qualities put together and these kind of these very intelligent moves that he makes you know if if you're about to say that oh this story of jesus is a kind of sun story that every pagan society or many pagan societies has as well he anticipates that and says yes all pagan sacrifice always already had was was preparing the way for the one true son of, of the self-sacrificing uh son of god uh, that's the kind of move that I love about um, Jesus of Nazareth, the trilogy especially, but all of his writing where um, he anticipates all the kind of objections of of the Nietzsche's and the Marxes and so forth. Well, we, sorry, we were shortly after he was named Pope, uh, we were presented with the opportunity to publish a book in which he had written, he had given an essay at the Bayerische Akademische, whatever it is, uh, along with Jürgen Habermas, who was kind of considered as the, the number one German philosopher. He's an agnostic, if not an atheist, but he's very highly respected as a philosopher. And so we had these, these two talks, and I began by reading Habermas's in German to see if he wanted to publish the whole thing, and I, I, I couldn't understand a single sentence. I thought, oh, gosh, maybe my German, I've, I've lost it, you know. I turned to Ratzinger, and it was limpid. It was clear. You know, mm -hmm. beautiful. It's kind of like St. John's Gospel. Or I would even make this comparison, listening to you talk about that, saying it's not academic. You know, the Lord of the Rings is not academic. But if, if J.R. Tolkien had not been a profoundly, you know, intelligent academic that wrote his own language, the new Norse, the new, I mean, you would never have the Lord of the Rings. So that's the genius, it seems to me, and how these people have the brilliance and academic credentials to be able to then, Lewis did that too. C.S. Lewis, another hero of mine, uh, who had tremendous you know, academic talent, but when he wrote, I mean, he wrote children's stories, you know, it was beautiful. So I think Benedict- But it, but it comes from a place of mastery. Exactly. Confidence uh, uh, that not many have, very few have. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, in You've learned a lot from the West and Christianity and uh, Ratzinger and the Mass and all these things. Uh, I've detected in some of your more recent writings and speeches, there's a little bit of nostalgia now for the things that the society you grew up in, now that you have a child especially, uh, that, that you see missing in America. Might you comment on that? What, what can we learn from you, Saurabh? Well, well not, not from me. And I... Um... This is a complicated and difficult question, but um, I'm I'm grateful to be an American and an American by choice. But as I grow into two things, as I grow into my faith on the one hand, and into my role as a as a husband and father, mm -hmm. I can't but uh, be alarmed by some of the trends in the West themselves, uh, in the West itself. The, the uh, this sort of disordered conception of individual autonomy, um, it, it, the uh, instinctive hostility toward anything traditional, anything that having to do with authority, all of it will, you know, I think terrifies me just in a practical way of, of how do I transmit the faith to my son? How do I not shield him, but prepare him for a world in which um, the desire to overcome the human in the most dehumanizing way has taken such a such shape because of technological advancement that we can say that, that we attempt at least to say that you know not only was Caitlyn Jenner never a man, but you know that he was a woman to, from the moment he was born, you know, uh, uh, it's a, this idea is about gender. It, just one example, I mean, uh, there are many others in many other realms of life um, where I, I think that it, um, I look back to my childhood and I appreciate some things about a society in which certain things are taken for granted as established fact about um, creation, about, um, the ontological differences between men and women, which by the way, they would never put it that way, just as self-evidently that men and women are, have different roles and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, in, in, in the lands of Islam, 
um, those rules, as it were, are just, as, as I said, a body of law and, and transmitted with, with a great deal of savagery. Um, whereas what we have in the West at its best is a tradition where we understand why there are rules about uh, about who men and women are, how to regulate their relations, and how to be regulate them in a humane way, and and, and so on and so forth. Um, it, and it's all based on on reason, but reason, uh, uh, a full definition of reason. In other words, not reason as merely a scientific technical thing, but reason that also expands to the things of God and the things of of uh, things having to do with moral law. And the, and, and the moral nature of human beings and so um, it's not that I long for the traditions of home it's that I can appreciate why people in traditional societies are hesitant when they look at the West today to say we want that uh, or, or, or it's certainly that they, they would hesitate to say we want the full package of you know uh, total autonomy uh, uh, which, by the way, doesn't bring you freedom. I mean, it's a, it, you know, paradoxically, autonomy of that kind is a kind of prison. Um, in the so that's where, that's where my, I'm sorry, that was very kind of complicated and abstract answer, but I hope it made some sense. Well, it does, but also it, it's sort of a paraphrase of what uh, Pope Benedict said on September 12, 2006 at Regensburg, yes. where he specifically called uh, both Islam to accept reason and not just will, mm -hmm. and on the West to expand reason beyond the scientism and scientific reason to accept the transcendent. So, I mean, really, uh, he's a father of the church for our time, and we'll be going back to him again and again for guidance, it seems to me. I constantly uh, direct people to the, to the Regensburg lecture because it is a really prophetic document and you summed it up really well calling islam to reason but then calling the west to bring reason to its fullness than to include yeah. uh, the the divine and the moral um it's i can't commend it enough to no it, it's, a, it's superb joseph any more questions from you uh well yeah we i for uh, comments we could carry on for some time but i think one thing I, we did we did it did strike me, and I think that I'd like maybe so up to, to comment on. Um, you know, you, when you went undercover uh, in the human trafficking of refugees into uh, into Europe, now you know there's obviously a rise of populism in Europe, and countries that I admire, such as Poland and Hungary, are obviously putting up resistance to the efforts of Germany and the European Union to impose. Uh, immigration quotas uh, for of, of, of Muslims coming into Europe. And what you showed, however, was the real horrible suffering. That certainly, the weak. I'm thinking of that one particular young man who had bullied. Um, the weak uh, are, are, are suffering due in that trafficking. It's trafficking itself. And obviously, we have to reach out to all, all human persons as neighbours. I mean, how how do you? How do you, having experienced that firsthand and having literally got your hands dirty, so to speak, how, is, how does that um, uh, make you feel about the, the crisis faced in Europe now with the, uh, with the refugee crisis? So uh, two, one, two points. The first one is that that's the chapter, you know, I, honestly, the book has been uh, uh, pretty well reviewed, uh, including in places like America. We, you know, and, and elsewhere were you. But the one criticism that I have gotten from both ideologically friendly places and otherwise is that where does that chapter fit into the narrative and why is it there? And to me, it's very clear. It's, uh, it's, it was my, the fullest taste of the fall that I've, that I've gotten. I think there's a great G.K. Chesterton quote, I'm going to butcher it, but that, you know, the only piece of revelation for which we have evidence is, is uh, you know, empirical evidence is the fall. Uh, uh, and, and that was my taking a really, uh, a, 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 a big spoonful of the fall of what it's like. Um, and it, it gave me the sense that there's no time to wait for me. 
I have to save my soul right away. Um, so that's why it's there. I, I, I know that's not your question, but I just wanted to address a lot of a lot of people have asked like, where yeah, is that? I, I, I thought there? that, and I agree that it, it needs to be there for that very reason. It was, it was a realistic dipping your toe into the reality of of the inferno, the reality of hell, and then recording and horror from it, which is in the title of the book. Now, to right. answer your question, so I went on this reporting trip with, um, to be honest, this, the sense that I would write a either a magazine article or maybe a book about the refugee crisis that would be um, sympathetic and and uh, with an idea that you know Europe can handle these people. There's, there's such suffering, and and uh, uh, you know, I, as an immigrant myself although of a different kind, you know, uh, I was not, we didn't sneak across borders to get to the US, but nevertheless, as an immigrant, uh, you know, I could give a, a, port, a, a sympathetic inside outside portrait. But what I saw there, I mean, was was one of my last kind of awakenings as a, 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 in terms of becoming serious about what the world is like. And I, I walked away a restrictionist, a kind of restrictionist, just because of what I saw that um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't help people who who are uh, stuck in these peripheral zones around Europe that are these these uh, peripheries that are really on fire uh, whether that's in in North Africa or or um, in Syria and Iraq and so forth but the idea that Europe can absorb this many people and assimilate them just and the type of people that they were, frankly, you know, that not as not aspirational migrants, but um, uh, but something else. Uh, it just it just seems implausible to me. Again, that doesn't mean that that Europe doesn't have a responsibility to assist, but I don't understand why that assistance has to take the form of you know uh, accepting a million and a half or, or something like that people within Europe's own boundaries. And then to insist that countries like you mentioned, like Hungary and Poland, which are already, which are fragile, or in some ways are broken countries uh, and, 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 and don't have the history of, of kind of integrating multiple cultures, but are sort of ethno-linguistically pretty homogenous and insisting that they even accept uh, tens of thousands of people against the popular will seems like to do that will will only invite more of a populist backlash and I don't understand why the likes of uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel or Emmanuel Macron or uh, Juncker and the like don't understand how they're inviting more of the thing that that they worry about most wonderful, erudite, eloquent, and balanced uh, uh, response to what I was hoping for. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. It was great. Thanks for your time on this. We're grateful for the book you wrote. And uh, I personally, as an old man now, I'm hopeful to see you, you know, part of the part of the mix of Catholic intellectuals that are helping to, you know, give guidance to both Catholics and, and the rest of the world in our country. So thank, well, thank you very much. Uh, before we close the show, we are going to... Uh, Talk about our next book. You mentioned uh, G.K. Chesterton. Here's a biography of him by Dale Alquist, who's probably the great American living, you know, author on Chesterton and a, and a great fan of Chesterton. So that'll be starting next week uh, on our live broadcast at 27. Joseph, do you have anything you want to say about this? Uh, 
um, if you keep those in mind as you read uh, the first chapter of, of Chesterton for next week's uh, book club. Great. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, you folks, for joining us. See you next week.